Welcome to NDD Evening News. Our top story tonight, former President Trump filing another appeal. This time to a Georgia appellate court asking them to overturn a decision that allows District Attorney Fonnie Willis to keep prosecuting the massive RICO case. A fundraising showdown, Trump aiming to beat President Biden's record money hole with an even more lucrative fundraiser. And Biden now sending a new message to Nikki Haley's voters. Iris Tao reports. Officials now warning migrants to avoid being cooked to death by the sun. Arian Pazdar has more on the stern message as the hot summer months draw near. A Wall Street Journal reporter in a Russian prison now for a year. Jack Bradley has the latest on his condition and how the State Department is responding. Israeli Defense Forces say they've killed multiple high-level terrorists across its borders. This comes as an Islamic Jihad terrorist confesses disturbing details of what he did on October 7th. Jason Perry has a war update. This is NTD Evening News, live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City. Here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Former President Trump filing an appeal in Georgia today. He and several co-defendants are asking the Court of Appeals to reverse the decision that keeps District Attorney Fani Willis on the case. Judge Scott McAvee allowed Willis and her office to continue to pursue the case with the stipulation that either Willis or Nathan Wade, the special prosecutor with whom she had a romantic relationship, must step down. Wade immediately resigned, but the defense attorneys want Willis and her entire office disqualified, which underscores that a potential disqualification is still possible. In his ruling earlier this month, McAfee criticized Willis for making what he called bad choices. The district attorney's office declined to comment. Texas keeps pressuring Congress, asking for stronger border legislation. Governor Greg Abbott now meeting with House Speaker Mike Johnson. This as ICE conducts a nationwide operation, arresting hundreds of illegal immigrants with drug convictions. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the update. House Speaker Mike Johnson and Texas Governor Greg Abbott met on Thursday to talk about the border crisis. The governor told Johnson that the crisis is both unacceptable and also avoidable. Abbott now wants the speaker to pass more border security legislation. It's not clear what legislation Abbott wants the speaker to pass, although some speculate it's a controversial border bill already passed by the Senate. House Republicans are not picking the bill up saying it would only allocate money to the border without actually tackling the problem. The meeting between the two comes just days after an appeals court ruled against a controversial Texas law, which would allow Texas to arrest and deport illegal immigrants. Johnson issued a statement after the meeting, saying the Biden administration is abusing its power to go after the state of Texas for attempting to safeguard its citizens. Texans and all Americans deserve better. And at the same time, agents at the Texas-Mexico border are reportedly concerned that migrants have become more aggressive towards law enforcement. That's according to News Nation, which received an internal memo sent from Texas authorities to CBP. And meanwhile, CBP wants to shed light on the dangers of crossing the U.S.-Mexico border in the upcoming summer months. An agent says crossing the desert has terrible outcomes for some who try. And they've died, and they've died alone out there in the desert, the most horrific way you can imagine, basically, you know, being cooked by the sun, and no one finds them for years. After animals have, have decimated the, car, the, the, the remains, there's nothing there except bleached bones. And lastly, ICE conducted a nationwide operation this month. Agents arrested over 200 immigrants with convictions for drug trafficking or multiple drug possessions. The footage you see here is from the actual operation. It took place across the U.S. in major cities such as Boston, Seattle and Washington, D.C. Arian Pastar, NTD News. Today marks one year since a reporter with the Wall Street Journal was jailed in Moscow. He's an American citizen who's been charged with espionage. NTD's Jack Bradley has more from Washington, D.C. Journalist Evan Gerskovich has been detained in Moscow now for a year. The Wall Street Journal honored him with their front page, saying that his story should be here. 
Now, the 32-year-old was seen in a Moscow courtroom behind a glass defendant's box smiling. He's stuck in a tiny cell for the whole day and night. Uh, he only has one other cellmate he, he can communicate with. Um, he has one hour daily, can he walk uh, outside in a tiny courtyard uh, of the cell. But despite the incredibly difficult circumstances, Evan remains strong. He remains hopeful for his release. Uh, he's not broken, neither physically or mentally. He's in good spirits. Gerskovich is the first American reporter to be arrested on espionage charges since 1986. Now, he's denied these allegations, and the American government has said that he's been wrongfully detained. Secretary of State Antony Blinken released a statement today saying, to date, Russia has provided no evidence of wrongdoing, and people are not bargaining chips. Russia should end its practice of arbitrarily detaining individuals for political leverage. Blinken also announced today that the State Department will be sanctioning Hong Kong officials for cracking down on human rights rights under the new national security law. He said there's an intensifying repression and ongoing crackdown by the Chinese regime and Hong Kong authorities on civil society, media and dissenting voices, including through the issuance of bounties and arrest warrants for more than a dozen pro-democracy activists living outside Hong Kong. Now, these sanctions are in response to an intensifying persecution on human rights in Hong Kong. Now, notably, Jimmy Lai, the founder of Apple Daily, a pro-democracy newspaper, has been arrested for four years in Hong Kong. We'll keep you updated on these sanctions as they come out. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jack Bradley, NTD News. Israel's Supreme Court has temporarily halted support for ultra-Orthodox Jews who don't enlist in the military. Beginning on April 1st, the nation will stop all state subsidies to Haredi Yeshiva students who defy the enlistment. This comes after the government was scrambling to roll out new conscription plans. Israel's draft policy applies to everyone above 18 besides those in the Haredi community. This new plan is putting more challenges on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, whose cabinet relies heavily on ultra-Orthodox support. Israel's Supreme Court previously found the exemptions discriminatory and illegal. It ordered the government to come up with a new plan by Monday. A large portion of Israelis said they want changes to be done to Haredi's military exemptions. Israel Defense Forces reported killing high-level terrorists in the Gaza Strip as well as in Lebanon. Meanwhile, an Islamic Jihad terrorist confesses graphic details of what he did during the October 7th terrorist attacks. NTD's Jason Perry has the details. And a warning, this report includes content that some viewers may find disturbing. On Friday, residents in northern Israel cleaned up the aftermath of a rocket attack from Hezbollah. The Lebanon-based terrorist group has been firing rockets into Israel since the war began to show its support for Hamas. Israel Defense Forces released a video Friday showing a strike on the deputy commander of Hezbollah's rocket and missile unit, who was reportedly responsible for carrying out attacks against civilians. And the day before, the IDF reported killing another senior terrorist, a Hamas leader, at Al-Shifa Hospital in the Gaza Strip. The senior Hamas official we eliminated is Rayed the Bet. The Bet served as the head of the supply and personnel corps of the military arm of Hamas. And he added this. At the same time during the night, the IDF destroyed a one and a half mile long tunnel route which is part of an underground system that crossed from north to south of the Gaza Strip. The IDF also released a video of an interview with an Islamic Jihad terrorist who participated in the October 7th attacks. The man said he entered a house in an Israeli village that day and found a scared girl inside. Uh, these men have children who were taken as hostages in the Gaza Strip on that same day. They met with Israel's prime minister on Thursday and said this afterwards. The physical security of Israel is not the only thing that matters here. The social security, the fabric of Israel, the knowledge that the government will take care of its citizens and will bring them home if something happens, that's broken and it has to be fixed. 
and the only way to fix it is to bring the hostages back. And the question is, how do you close this gap in the negotiations after six months? It's six months too long. We don't have six more months to keep on negotiating. We need to get a deal. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem's old city, people sang and carried a cross as they observed Good Friday. I hope one day for the glory of God and, and our Savior Jesus, uh, the Messiah, Yeshua. I hope one day all these divisions will get unified for the glory of God. Worshippers walked along the Via Dolorosa, the cobblestone path on which Jesus is said to have carried the cross to his crucifixion. Jason Perry, NTD News. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Former President Trump now seeking to outdo President Biden, who raked in a record $26 million at a Manhattan fundraiser. It comes as Biden is trying to showcase his cash edge over Trump and court Nikki Haley voters. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao joins us now. Iris, what is the latest in this Biden-Trump duel? Right, so the two men right now are in a fundraising competition. Former President Trump's campaign says is going to hold a fundraiser in Palm Beach, Florida next week and aiming to raise a stunning $33 million. And that's right after President Biden just last night here in New York City held a campaign event with its predecessors Barack Obama and Bill Clinton and raising a stunning $26 million. That's a record for Democrat in history in campaigns. Meanwhile, the three Democratic presidents last night took turns to target Trump, criticizing him, with Biden taking a shot at Trump over his physical fitness. Here's a clip of it released by his campaign. Watch. My question to you, sir, can voters trust a presidential candidate who has not won a single Trump International Golf Club trophy? At long last, sir, have you no chip shot? Well, look, I'd be happy to play. I told him this before when he came into the Oval, when he was being, before he got sworn in. I said, I'll give you three strokes if you carry your own bag. And former President Trump, meanwhile, has been claiming that he's a lot more fit than Biden and has been questioning Biden's mental acuity. And last night at the fundraiser, Biden tried to defend his own age, saying that age brings him more wisdom. And all this is as today, Biden's campaign sent out a new ad targeting Trump and also targeting Nikki Haley's voters by courting those voters. Let's take a look. He is, she's gone haywire. There aren't that many never Trumpers anymore. How do you bring these Nikki Haley voters back into the town? I'm not sure we need too many. And President Biden has been holding a lot of campaign events in different battleground states across the country. And next Tuesday, former President Trump will be in the battleground state of Michigan to give a speech about, quote, Biden's border bloodbath. Back to you. Iris, thank you so much for that update. TikTok fighting back against a potential ban of its app by launching a $2.1 billion advertising campaign. The ad makes the argument of how important TikTok is to its users. There is no doubt that I would not have found the success that I have today without TikTok. The ad titled Built to Life on TikTok focuses on the company's view that it has a positive impact on small businesses. CNBC reports these ads are airing in five battleground states where vulnerable Senate Democrats are up for re-election. And that data shows the ads will continue running in various markets until as late as April 28th. The House overwhelmingly passed a bill which, if signed into law, would give TikTok's China-based parent company ByteDance a choice. Either divest the app within about six months of the signing, or TikTok would be banned from app stores in the U.S. The bill is now in the Senate waiting for a vote. A heavy crane able to lift a thousand tons will help clear the wreckage in Baltimore Harbor. That's in the aftermath of this week's catastrophic bridge collapse. Experts expect the cost to restore the waterway and rebuild the bridge could surpass $2 billion. Our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez has more on this story. The largest crane in the northeast U.S. arrived in Baltimore today to assist in removing over 4,000 pounds of debris hanging over the container ship Dolly and over the Baltimore Harbor. 
Demolition experts believe they can open a single lane channel in approximately a month by clearing the debris in the 1,200 foot area in between the two main pillars of the bridge. The Port of Baltimore is the ninth busiest port in the United States and the second largest exporter of coal. Around $220 million worth of goods transit through the port every day. It employs over 8,000 people with a payroll of over $2 million daily. The port is the largest importer and exporter of cars and light trucks in the country with more than 850,000 vehicles moving through every year. Government officials have stressed that the cleaning and recovery of the waterway is a matter of national concern. The disaster will affect the supply chains of the Northeast and businesses dependent on them. But collectively as a supply chain, we should find alternative um, ports, uh, whether in New York, Virginia, Charleston. There are other opportunities for us to you know, enable the logistical part of this to get back into the supply chains. According to experts, the operation will cost over a billion dollars and Congress will most likely have to intervene to facilitate the funds. I've heard from colleagues all over the country, county executives and mayors, um, who are small, large, rural, rural, urban, Democrat, Republican, um, you know, but for the grace of God, this could be any of us. And uh, I hope that this doesn't become something that's partisan and logged up. I'd like to see Congress move quickly. The Department of Transportation's emergency relief program outlines a plan in which the federal government will pay for 90 percent of the reconstruction costs and the state of Maryland the remaining 10 percent. That fund only has nine hundred and fifty million dollars. Next week, when President Biden visits the Port of Baltimore, it is expected that he will ask Congress to facilitate more funds. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. Joining us now to dive into the impacts of the bridge collapse and what needs to be done in the future is Tommy Waller. He's the president and CEO of the Center for Security Policy. Tommy Waller, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Now, cleanup efforts are underway following the Baltimore Bridge collapse. Now, given this is the ninth biggest port in the country for international cargo, what are the economic implications of this? Yeah, well, obviously we have a tragic loss of life, um, but livelihoods too, right? So you have 140,000 employees uh, that are without work, uh, at least temporarily. About $15 million a day is what the economic activity was in that particular port. But the loss, the economic loss, will be far greater because of the implications. And it's not just uh, for America. When, when you look at the war in Europe right now, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the energy resources required by Europe, 70 percent of the coal that this country exported to Western Europe went through that port, 60 percent of the liquefied natural gas. So you're going to see not only you know economic impacts in a negative way for the United States of America, but also for our European allies. On that note, what about the national security concerns? Are there any military implications here? Yeah, absolutely, Tiffany. You know, the, the U.S. has what's called the Ready Reserve Force, which is a fleet of 48 vessels that provide about half of the government-owned sea lift surge capability. Predominantly supports the Army and the Marine Corps. Out of those 48 ships, right now, four of them, four of the six that operated out of that port, are actually trapped, right? So you're looking at roughly 10% of that surge capability uh, for overseas support of the U.S. military. Uh, that's, that's a big deal. And so it, this absolutely could have implications strategically for the military. And given all the lives impacted, whether the ones lost or the livelihoods, there's been a lot of talks about the ship and the bridge, what led to the collapse. What do we know about the vessel and the issues that led up to this? Sure. Yeah, well, we know that the Dolly had electrical issues in port, right? And it, it had kind of a history of those. And we know that they left the port without resolving those issues. We also know that the, the parent company that contracted that ship is Maersk. And Maersk, in fact, had recently been fined uh, by the U.S. federal government on retaliating against an employee, a whistleblower, who sounded the alarm about issues that the company was facing. So one of the things that needs to be investigated is, of course, why did the ship leave the harbor with electrical issues? Where did those electrical issues come from? I mean, it is uh, a point that we've been warned by the federal government recently about the risk of Chinese manufactured cranes and the fact that they've found these different uh, hardware modems that are in these cranes, and that's a national security risk. Well, the Port of Baltimore, it, it operates Chinese cranes. So one of the things that needs to be investigated is, 
did these electrical issues, were they somehow caused uh, by malicious intent? And unfortunately, you know, it's it's very worrisome when you see federal officials immediately saying, well, there's, you know, there's no evidence of malicious intent. No, that needs to be investigated. And so does the ship, the crew and, and the parent company to find out were there employees that knew that there could be issues and didn't sound the alarm because of the, the type of retaliation that took place in the past with that parent company, Maersk. Hmm. And now on the flip side, what about the bridge itself? Was it particularly vulnerable to this type of a hazard? Yeah, actually it was, uh, Tiffany. So that the truss style bridge uh, is vulnerable to what well, people, if you watched the video, you saw it, right? I mean, the ship struck the pylon and the entire bridge collapsed. And, and 50 years ago, these truss style bridges, that was the way they were constructed because at the time it was very economically efficient with the materials that we have. You now see bridges constructed in a much different way with arches and cables that are much more resilient to, to you know, a single impact taking out an entire bridge. And so one of the things is, and look, back in 1980, May of 1980, there was a bridge that, that stretched across uh, in the vicinity of Tampa that was struck by a ship. It collapsed, 35 people died, and that should have been a wake-up call, right? And so all of these truss-style bridges, they should be evaluated to see whether or not they need protections. There's something called dolphins, which are kind of like, you know, big donut-shaped concrete barriers. And there's some argument back and forth, Tiffany, as to whether or not this roughly 1,000-ton ship moving at eight and a half, nine knots could have been stopped by such dolphins, these protections. But it seems to me that it would have been prudent for those to have been installed. And this is something where, you know, states are going to have to take the lead when it comes to protecting these bridges, because I just don't trust that the federal government uh, has it as a top priority right now or is even capable. Mm. And given the economic and national security concerns this incident has raised, what else should happen as a result of this? So, for, Tiffany, first and foremost is, is a very significant investigation. There should be congressional hearings. Uh, you know, I've heard mention that, okay, the federal government's going to immediately pay for uh, this accident and the, the rebuilding of the bridge. I'm not necessarily saying that the federal government shouldn't help. But what I'm concerned about is, is there going to be an effort to sweep under the rug that kind of investigation? If the insurance company was on, on uh, the, the, the dime to pay for this, you can bet that there'll be a very thorough investigation in terms of the causes, right, and, and what needs to happen to mitigate these things. So that's absolutely number one, is we need to know the truth about what happened. And that includes whether this was somehow malicious and whether it was potentially a cyber-induced uh, catastrophe. Right. Because a lot of times, Tiffany, what happens is when there's when there's cyber and there's a, you know, whether it be Russia, China or, or one of our adversaries is involved, there's an effort to really make it hush hush and, and classify it at such a level that the people who actually need to know what happened are often the last that are told. So we need transparency and investigations and we need an immediate look at the other bridges uh, that are vulnerable to this type of, of hazard, whether it be purposeful or accidental, so that they can be protected sufficiently. Tommy Waller, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Tiffany, for having me on. Welcome back. If you're just joining us now, here are some of today's top headlines. Authorities began clearing the shipping lane and clearing debris from the collapsed Baltimore Bridge. Officials stress that the cleanup and recovery of the waterway is a matter of national concern. House Speaker Mike Johnson and Texas Governor Greg Abbott met to discuss border security. The governor told Johnson that the border crisis is unacceptable and asked him to pass bills addressing border security. Israel's Supreme Court temporarily halted government funds to ultra-Orthodox yeshiva students who are traditionally exempt from mandatory military service. It was a historic ruling that could have far-reaching consequences for the government. The government has to revise its military conscription plan by Monday. Former President Trump and several of his co-defendants appealed a judge's ruling on Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis. Judge Scott McAfee allowed Willis to continue prosecuting the Georgia RICO case. Lawyer John Eastman, who advised former President Trump in his challenges to the 2020 presidential election, is facing potential disbarment in California. Joining us now to discuss this case is Jonathan Houlihan. He's general counsel and director of legal operations at Citizens Defending Freedom. Jonathan Houlihan, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. 
Case, a judge has ruled that former election lawyer for Trump, John Eastman, should be disbarred. Now, help us understand this. What are the grounds for disbarment? Well, well, it's, each state has different rules. Uh, each state has, they're, they're mainly consistent. Uh, you know, there's obvious ones, misallocation of funds, things like that. In John Eastman's case, it's because of the alleged uh, misinformation, misleading of his client dealing with the uh, election, the 2020 election. Um, I think part of it, uh, and according to Mr. Eastman, what he has said is that uh, he has not shown remorse. Uh, which is not a standard that uh, I, I've really seen in those bar rules, um, other than uh, to at least disbar him. That may go to mitigate to some of the punishment he receives, but not whether or not he's disbarred. Um, now, with that, I think this is goes to a larger trend of attacking lawyers that are defending clients uh, for various unpopular stances. You've seen in big law, uh, many law firms have, uh, they don't take certain cases if it's allegedly unpopular with, with uh, some on the left. You don't see a lot of big law firms taking up causes that are so-called conservative. So I think this is just an outgrowth of that. When you juxtapose that with our founding, look at John Adams. Uh, John Adams defended British soldiers from the Boston Massacre. Extremely unpopular. Uh, extremely unpopular with the colonists, Sam Adams and such. But because... John Adams believed in the rule of law. He believed in everyone had a right to a defense. Did you see a movement even during colonial America to disbar John Adams for defending British uh, soldiers for the Boston Massacre? Of course not. That's because our nation was built on laws and the rule of law. So this is just furtherance of targeting lawyers that uh, stand up for the conservative side or uh, maybe a viewpoint that's not particular, particularly popular. And I think it's a shame and it's a travesty and it, it ultimately it hurts the rule of law. On that note, what would be the precedent this would set if Eastman is disbarred? What would that, what impact would that have on the legal profession as a whole? Well, in California, it'll, it'll certainly have an impact. I mean, uh, I'm sure it would frighten or chill any lawyers willing to take any kind of election case that would challenge kind of the status quo, challenge the narrative. So it could have a very chilling effect on legal representation. And again, that goes to the rule of law. And in this nation, everybody has a right to the defense. Everybody has a right to a certain viewpoint. And that's how, that's the foundation of our nation. If you take that away, if you take the ability to present a legal defense, I mean, you live, you truly live in a, in a tyranny. And that's, that's not consistent with our constitution. That's not consistent with our belief system. That's not consistent with the rule of law. And it's a travesty and it needs to be corrected. And I'm hopeful uh, that uh, disbarment order is not finalized, and, and uh, Mr. Eastman can continue with his bar license. Now, a U.S. district judge in the District of Columbia, Reggie Walton, appeared on CNN and criticized Trump for going after a judge and the judge's daughter in the hush money case. Now, this judge is facing calls for impeachment. What are the grounds for impeachment, and what are the codes of conduct that a sitting judge normally should follow? Well, it's certainly um, the, the federal rules and the code of conduct uh, make it improper for any judge to comment on a, on a current case. So going in, in on, on television and commenting on current cases as a federal judge, that's certainly going to buy him, I would imagine, some complaints uh, with either on the ethics side, on the judicial conduct side. Uh, but more than that, Article 2 of the Constitution grants Congress the ability to impeach federal judges. It hasn't happened uh, too often in our nation's history. I think uh, normally they resign in the face of misconduct. Uh, there's There's been, uh, I believe, 20 or so federal judges gone through the impeachment process. Um, but in this case, uh, going on, commenting on, a, uh, on an active federal case would certainly buy them a, a misconduct charge, maybe a complaint, maybe it's, it's, uh, it's found to be valid. And I'm certain at that point, uh, there will be additional calls for any kind of impeachment. Um, so it, the bottom line is you, you shouldn't, as a federal judge, you shouldn't comment on active cases that are in the, in the uh, judicial system. Jonathan Houlihan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Georgia now has tighter election rules. The changes involve challenging voter eligibility and qualifying for the state's presidential ballot. 
The move could impact the 2024 presidential race in the battleground state. The bill would allow any political party that has qualified for the presidential ballot in at least 20 states on Georgia's ballot that could be a boost to independent candidates such as Robert F. Kennedy Jr. The bill also spells out what constitutes probable calls for upholding challenges to voter eligibility that could lead to voters being removed from the rolls. Probable calls would exist if someone is dead or if they're already voted or are registered to vote in a different jurisdiction. Democrats criticize the provision. They say it would overwhelm election administrators and disenfranchise voters. Fast food restaurants across California are bracing for the new minimum wage hike for employees starting next Monday. People are anticipating layoffs and more expensive meals. Some California fast food restaurants are laying off workers to prepare for the $20 minimum wage hike on April 1st. Governor Gavin Newsom signed the bill into law in September. According to Business Insider, in December, two franchisees for Pizza Hut plan to lay off 1,200 employees. It may get rid of their own delivery drivers and opt for third-party delivery instead. McDonald's will not have a uniform price change, but it told the Los Angeles Times that it would figure out how to counterbalance the increase in labor costs. Coffee lovers can also expect higher drink prices at Starbucks. Auntie Anne's and Cinnabon have considered layoffs or closures. The new law would increase the minimum wage by $4, from $16 per hour to $20. Melissa Melendez, a former California state representative, explains the California Insider opinion why there was so much controversy. Now, the state of California would never put up with something like that. If, if the federal government said, well, California, um, we've decided we're going to dictate what your minimum wage is in California. And we think that minimum wage, because it's so expensive to live in California, it should be $40 an hour. Oh, and that's going to include all of your government employees. They all have to get paid $40 an hour. Do you think the state of California would take that line down? Of course not, because it would bankrupt them. And that's what they're doing with all of these fast food franchises. Previously, there was controversy over whether the law allowed Panera to be exempted from the wage increase because the owner is a friend who donated to Newsom's campaign. The exemption in the law says if an establishment produces and sells bread on site as a standalone item, such as a bakery, they can keep wages at 16 an hour, which implied Panera. But Newsom's office denied the connection, adding that Panera would not be exempted from the wage hike. Staying in the Golden State, state officials are debating measures to combat retail theft. A bill that would give police increased authority to arrest shoplifters has bipartisan support in the legislature. But some critics warn it would result only in mass incarceration. Entity's Jason Blair has more. In California, stealing items totaling a value of up to $950 is considered shoplifting and is a misdemeanor. Anything over $950 is considered theft or burglary and is a felony. According to the newly proposed Assembly Bill 1990 for a shoplifting misdemeanor, current law only allows police to arrest someone if the alleged crime happened in their presence. If passed, AB 1990 would allow police to arrest suspected shoplifters, whether the alleged crime happened in their presence or not, if they have probable cause. Republican Assembly member Juan Alanis, the bill's co-author, said in a March 20th press release, quote, Strengthening our laws and enhancing enforcement capabilities are essential to deter these crimes and protect the livelihoods of our citizens. Democratic Assembly member Wendy Carrillo, the bill's author, said, quote, The STOP Act is an urgent call to action in response to the alarming escalation of organized retail theft that threatens the very fabric of our communities. Increased retail theft has been a major concern in California. Some retailers have resorted to means like escorting shoppers to reduce the issue. They've taken the step of asking individuals coming into the store to show their ID to be escorted as they're shopping. The bill also has its critics. Assembly member Tina McKinner posted on X, quote, We don't need AB 1990, which will only promote mass incarceration. The bill has been amended once since it was introduced in January and is currently waiting to be heard by the Committee on Public Safety. Jason Blair, NTD News. 
Over at NTD's China in Focus, we've prepared a special report for you about Chinese infiltration in the U.S. media. Here's a look. A troubling agenda revealed certain Western media outlets are publishing content in line with propaganda from a tyrannical regime, the Chinese Communist Party, at least when it comes to a major human rights violation committed against practitioners of the Falun Gong spiritual movement inside China. And at the center of that problem, really unfortunately, is the paper of record, the New York Times. Why was this journalism so off the mark? And so here was the leadership of the New York Times meeting with the leadership of the largest tyrannical communist regime on earth. Watch our exclusive interview with Levi Browdy, executive director of the Falun Dafa Information Center, this Saturday on NTD, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Tune in this Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time to learn more. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, a lot going on today in sports, but let's start in college basketball. Now the Sweet 16 started last night with four games. We do have another for this evening. Who do you like in tonight's contest? Yeah, we had a couple surprises in last night's game as top seeded North Carolina was upset by Alabama, Clemson upset Arizona. So if your back brackets weren't already br busted, they probably are now, mine are for sure. But tonight we start with NC State Marquette. The Wolfpack were actually the lowest seeded team left. I think Marquette is finally the team that takes them down. That's followed by Purdue Gonzaga, which would be a really good matchup, but I think per Purdue will prevail. They got Zach Eady in the middle there. Then the late games are Duke versus Houston and Creighton versus Tennessee. Now, I think Houston takes down Duke, especially since that game is right there in Texas. And I think Tennessee prevails over Creighton, what should be a very close matchup. Now, the women's game is also at the Sweet 16 stage today and tomorrow. How is this tournament shaping up? It actually looks much different from the men's, much fewer upsets. In fact, two of the four regions, each of the top four seeds already advanced to the Sweet 16, and those games are going on today. Now, already Oregon State, top Notre Dame, 70 to 65, and South Carolina leads Indiana late in that one. Then tonight, it's Stanford against NC State and Texas Gonzaga. Now, tomorrow, we have Caitlin Clark and Iowa playing Colorado, while defending champion LSU plays UCLA. Now, this could set up a very interesting rematch as LSU and Angel Reese beat Iowa last year for the NCAA title. Maybe there's some lingering feelings between those teams. Now, tomorrow, you also have Baylor versus USC and perennial power UConn taking on Duke. UConn is trying to get back to the Final Four after having their 14-year streak of making it there uh, last year uh, snapped. Now, you mentioned previously that Caitlin Clark has an offer to play in the Big Three Professional League, which would make her the only female to do so. Has she commented on that? You know, she actually said she found out just when everybody else did, which would have been Wednesday when Ice Cube posted uh, on Twitter. Ice Cube founded the league and was the commissioner there. He confirmed on Twitter that, yes, he offered her $5 million for one season. Now, Clark said she has, quote, people that deal with these things and that she's focused on the Sweet 16 game against Colorado. Now, that's a little unusual, I thought, to hear a college student say that, but she's the highest earning female college basketball player. I mean, her NIL package is reportedly worth more than $3 million. She has deals with Nike, Gatorade, Buick, State Farm, and really a handful of others. One other thing is that to consider if she does sign with the WNBA first, the WNBA has prioritization rules that prevent some players at least from playing overseas. It's unclear if that would prevent them from playing in a domestic league, but this would be a very unique situation. But there's still a lot to figure out if she was going to play in that league. Shifting gears to baseball yesterday was the home opener for the Oakland A's, which usually results in a sellout. But few fans showed up as plenty protested instead. What's going on over there? I mean, this is about the most hostile fan base versus ownership situation I've ever seen. They only had a paid attendance of 13,000 fans, which was about half the attendance of last year's home opener. But only a fraction of that number actually came into the stadium. Instead, they held a protest right outside to show their displeasure with the owner, uh, John Fisher. Now, Fisher has already agreed to move the team to Las Vegas in 2028. Now, the fans were already unhappy with him for years because they constantly had one of the lowest payrolls in the game. The situation was probably made worse by their stadium situation, actually. Now, in baseball, to get fans to come to the park, 
you kind of have to sell them on the whole ballpark experience because sometimes baseball gets to be a little bit of a slow game. Now, they have tried to like speed that up in recent years. But anyway, their stadium, Oakland Coliseum, although it's very old, it's not iconic like Fenway Park or Wrigley Field that fans love that. So it doesn't really attract an audience. It, this is, and this is only has worsened their financial situation. And now they've really completely alienated the few fans they have left. Yet they still have four years before they go to Vegas. Uh, so it's an ugly situation. I think this is going to be an ongoing storyline for this whole season. Well, Dave, as always, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Tiff. Are electric vehicles on their way out? Not exactly, but EV sales are seeing a slump. Tesla, Ford and GM are all slashing EV prices. Ford is slowing production on its electric F-150 Lightning and Mercedes-Benz says it won't meet its 2025 EV and hybrid sales goals. NTD's Chris Beers was at the New York Auto Show talking with experts and auto dealers about the future of electric vehicles. Here's that report. So we know electric vehicles are seeing a slump in sales right now, but why is this happening? To answer that question, I'm joined by, right next to me, Lauren Fix, the car coach and automotive expert. Lauren, talk to me about this. Well, you know, it's funny, the government's mandating electric vehicles and consumers are thinking, I don't know if this works for me, but how you can tell what the results are is go buy any dealer lot and there's tons of electric vehicles. So the manufacturers have delivered on really cool product that gives what they've promised. Unfortunately, the electric grid is not there, whether you charge at home or you charge on the road, it doesn't necessarily work for our lifestyle. And the pushback has been dramatic and people are now looking at hybrids. The EV market took off in 2021 and 2022. The leader of Ford's EV division, Marin Gaia, told CNBC that it was a temporary market spike. He said demand is still growing, but not nearly at the expected rate. Another factor behind slow EV sales is price. The average, $60,000 in 2023. It's also putting a charging station in your home by a certified electrician. Check with your insurance company because they're going to increase your rates as well for your home insurance. And if you're renting or you're staying at a place that's not, that doesn't have a garage, well, there's no place to charge, which brings you to going to public charging, which costs money. A Boston Consulting Group study found that people would buy electric vehicles that charge in 20 minutes or less, go for more than 350 miles and cost less than $50,000. Only one car on the market meets this standard right now. The Hyundai Ioniq 6SE rear wheel drive long range. Despite this, one dealer we spoke with seems optimistic. Yeah, so I mean, the EV sales are still growing, right? I think there's a misconception out there that they're not performing. Uh, they are still on a growing trend. Last year, 2023, was the best year ever with over a million EV sales here in the U.S. Uh, and so that market continues to grow. But Cox Automotive said in its 2025 industry report, expectations for EV growth in the U.S. have shifted from rosy to reality as sales increase. Cox says customer acceptance of EVs isn't keeping pace. This goes against the Biden administration's push for EVs. Well, the Biden administration is all about the Green New Deal, pushing electric vehicles on a global basis. That's part of the World Economic Forum's platform. We know that. You can read it. Anybody can see that. However, the problem is, as you're pushing it here in the United States, Americans buy with what they want, and that's SUVs. They're buying trucks, and those do not meet the current government's uh, demand. The president is facing an uphill battle for EV adoption and his administration's efforts could come to a halt depending on who wins the 2024 presidential race. Former President Donald Trump is expected to undo fuel economy mandates if he's elected again. That means manufacturers and consumers alike face EV uncertainty. Chris Beers, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. For around-the-clock coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. From all of us at NTD, wish you and your loved ones a wonderful, happy Easter this weekend. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.